Welcome to the Agroecology Food System Transformation from Field to Fork Virtual Seminar. Uh, I'm Karen Hansen Kuhn. I'm Program Director at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. We have a really exciting list of speakers today. Um, I want to start with a few housekeeping notes on, on how things will work. Um, before we begin, um, look at the Zoom webinar control panel hovering near the bottom. You can ask questions with presenters at any time through the presentation by typing your questions in the Q&A box uh, located on the panel and then selecting the send button. We'll get to as many questions as we can. So please send your questions as they come in to you. You can find the interpretation button uh, in the webinar control panel as well. It looks like it'll look like a little globe at the bottom. Uh, we have French and Spanish translators on the webinar, so feel free to select the appropriate language. Did the interpreters want to add something here? Okay, maybe not. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on IETP's website after the fact. We'll send links to all of the attendants and registrants. So we're going to start with a poll. Uh, Colleen, can you launch that? Um, so we'd like to see where people are joining from and what your relationship is to agroecology. So we're launching this poll uh, to share as we get started. So uh, to get us started, the dominant food system is exploitative and extractive, but examples from around the world demonstrate that a more just and fair food system is possible. Agroecological approaches have evolved to offer a set of guiding principles that can help transform our food systems to create more just, more socially just, diverse, holistic, and sustainable food systems that better respect and benefit cultures, the environment, and people engaged at every level. Agroecological approaches are anchored in human rights, rooted in culturally and ecologically diverse knowledge systems and have the potential to build the community resilience necessary to deal with both the forces of climate change and corporate control. Yet there have been roadblocks to advancing agroecology globally, and I will speak more slowly. This virtual seminar is sponsored by the Institute from Agriculture and Trade Policy and the Cooperación Internacional pour le Développement et la Solidarité, CITSE. ITP is an NGO working at the intersection of policy and practice to ensure fair and sustainable food farm and trade systems. We're rooted in research and coalition work, advocating for policy in the public interest at the state, federal, and international levels. CITSE, is an international family of Catholic social justice organizations working for transformational change to end poverty and inequalities, challenge systemic injustice, inequity, destruction of nature, and promote just and environmentally sustainable alternatives. CITSE brings together 18 member organizations from Europe and North America, and its international secretariat is based in Brussels. So now I think, uh, Colleen will be sharing the results of the poll. Can you post that? I don't, there you go. So we have people from really all over the world. So let's get started. So our first presenter today is Sophia Murphy, Executive Director of IETP. She's based in the United States. Sophia is a food systems and international economy expert with 30 years of professional experience, including as board chair, program director, and published writer. A policy expert and advocate who has focused on resilient food systems, agriculture, and international trade, Sophia has worked primarily with civil society organizations, as well as with government, intergovernmental organizations, and universities. Sophia, can you start us off? Sophia, you might turn. Yeah, I, I you had are. to. Uh, I had to get permission to open up my camera. It's a. It's a big event for us. It's really exciting to be here, and to welcome everyone. IHB is is so excited to cooperate and collaborate with Sidze 
and to bring all of you together for this um, in-depth look at what agroecology means to us all. Um, so I, I wanted to start, um, well, for us, agroecology is about bringing people together, being able to determine what food we grow, how we grow it, how we get paid for it, what we eat, um, and, and how we access the food that we eat. It's about a whole food system, in other words, um, and understanding the connections and the relationships uh, um, that are built into the food system. So for IATP, the entry point really is, um, has always been about that question of food distribution and the relationships among communities, both how to exchange knowledge in producing food, but also exchanging the food itself and um, exchanging food practices. So that it's not really a single um, method or a kind of list of instructions that defines agroecology, but really a kind of philosophy and an approach to how we think about um, food as a whole. I first heard about agroecology probably 20 years ago or so when I was first working at IETP um, in an earlier iteration. And it was the work of Miguel Altieri that I read. And the insight I took away from the first lesson in agroecology was the idea that you see um, the food potential in a whole landscape rather than the yield in an individual plant. And I think we'll be coming back to that a lot throughout the day. This, this idea of understanding an, an interconnected place as opposed to focusing on a specific um, technology or plant um, or technique. And it was about 20 years ago as well that I first met the farmers who organized as Masipag, an organization based in the Philippines that was working with farmers to improve their livelihoods by reducing their dependence on external um, inputs and um, reducing their environmental footprint at the same time. And the example that the organizers from Masipag gave me was to talk about the traditional um, flooded rice paddies in which farmers often would keep fish in order to feed the household. And that with the advent of green revolution seeds and hybrids, that fish um, cultivation became impossible because the water was poisoned and would no longer sustain life. So that in order to increase the rice yield, you'd actually lost the source of protein. That was an important part of the nutrition for the households and farm families in that community. And I think that that's another um, example for me that, that exemplifies what agroecology is about, how to do more with what you have by thinking about it as a whole. And all those years ago at IATP, we were involved in a series of projects that we didn't call agroecology, but that I think you could, you, you could see where agroecology was influencing the thinking and the understanding, whether they were arguments with the US Army Corps of Engineers about um, how to manage floodplains or um, arguments with the chemical companies um, that their use of genetically modified seeds was going to generate a generation of superbugs and super weeds that in the long run were going to um, undermine the very production that they were supposed to be enhancing, or arguments about the control of fertilizer use and the damage that excess fertilizer was doing to the water system and to industries downstream where marine populations were, were being choked to death effectively um, by the effects of, of nitrous oxide, um, excess nitrogen in the water. But for me, I think the, the example that best exemplifies what agroecology is about with IATP is Peace Coffee and the, the fair trade company that we set up out of going to Mexico, first to Chiapas, and meeting with farmers organizations there to talk about NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And we were interested to, to, to think about cross-border experiences and what trade policy was doing to the domestic agriculture um, policies that governments were implementing. But the farmers pushed back and, and wanted instead to be talking about markets and about price instability and about their lack of bargaining power um, to the, with the coffee uh, buyers that they were selling to. And out of that experience, Peace Coffee was born, a, a, a for-profit serving a non-profit, which is initially IATP, Peace Coffee is now an independent company, and a fair trade model that was rooted in these issues that were determined by the farming communities that we wanted to collaborate with. 
and, and there's a lot of elements to that story. The fair trade story is important, the connection of, of the producers and the consumers, the understanding that food systems can be both large and small and still connected, but also that taking the lead from the farmers growing the coffee who had their agenda were clear what they wanted from the relationship. So I think that in those 20 years, there's a lot that's happened. I, I, I think switching gears to think about where we are now and wanting to, to recognize first a lot of the work that's gone in at the multilateral level to define agroecology um, for us as a global community and then leaving the space for the, for the local um, for the local definition and ownership of what agroecology is all about. We're involved at the moment in a bit of a national struggle with the United States, US government setting up um, an alliance of what it calls, you know, sustainable production, which is trying to promote a lot of the technologies that agroecology has emerged to resist, insisting on pesticide use, fertilizer, um, inorganic fertilizers, hybrid seeds, genetic engineering. And in, and in marshalling the arguments about why that's a problem, and in thinking about the arguments that we've had at the multilateral system, trying to get governments to adopt principles of agroecology so that we can ground what we think agroecology is in an agreed approach. I think that we've moved the whole discussion to a, to a new level and to an important place where we're able to take um, strength from what we share internationally and at the same time give meaning to agroecology where we are. And I think if, for me, COVID has been a really important lesson for us all for, for what's wrong in the food system, much of which we would have been saying um, and pointing to for a long time, but also for some of the opportunities perhaps that, that as a movement we can, we can build on and um, exploit. I hope that we'll hear more about some of that um, today. I think that the, the COVID, I think the COVID challenge was um, in some ways an unexpected thing because it, it didn't, it was a food, it was a food insecurity challenge that didn't start with a lack of food. There was plenty of food in the supply, but we saw the ways in which the food system was, was inappropriate and maladapted to deal with the shock. And so we had a lot of food and then an extraordinary amount of waste. And that was especially true in North America, where half or more of the food that we produce is geared for food that's consumed outside of the home. So once we were consumed to our homes, we had to redefine what it meant to have food and to have enough. And we saw there was enormous waste from things like the potatoes that were destined to become French fries or the chicken that was designed to become chicken nuggets. Those foods were no longer being consumed and there was no place for them to go. And that other kinds of food and manageable quantities like flour or yeast in order to make bread, those were hard to come by. And I think that it was a lesson both in resilience and in redundancy. And a, a focus for a lot of us working and thinking about agroecology is on medium and long-term outcomes. We're trying to flatten at least the trajectory of climate change by reducing um, greenhouse gas emissions. We're trying to protect biodiversity and, and species survival. But COVID forced attention on some very immediate problems in our food system that are very important to agroecology as well. Most especially the vulnerability of, of workers in the food system, their lack of rights, their, their lack of basic worker rights, their lack of human rights, and, and the price that they paid in their lives in exposure to the disease and the exposure of the, the kind of living conditions that they have was an, a really important part, I think, of understanding where the food system is vulnerable and where thinking about agroecology principles would lead you to a different, a very different outcome. I think we also saw how the efficiencies lauded by the market model that we have in place generates enormous inefficiency and waste when there's a lack of um, ability to respond and react. And so I think that and, and the third thing I want to say is that we saw what we can do for food security and for, and for household well-being by putting a guaranteed income in people's hands. 
and by breaking the dominance of industrial food systems, forcing open spaces that a lot of the local food systems were able to respond to when the larger um, concentrated system started to break down. And that we, we saw how that could generate less waste overall in the end. And I think we see possibilities to redefine efficiency because we, we want to have an efficient food system, but we have to re-imagine um, what that would mean. I think that the principle from the high level panel of experts, the HLPE acronym that we're going to hear a lot today, I suspect, they had a principle called synergy. And I really think that that word is a powerful word for what we're getting at, that synergy doesn't mean doing away with all excess, but it means, I think, a certain adaptive capacity to respond to, to the situation that we're in. I think that I would maybe emphasize two other principles in closing that for IETP are crucial. The first is democracy. And, and back to that fair trade conversation and what it meant for us to go to Chiapas to be listening to farmers organizations there and bringing that together with the work we were doing with farmers organizations in the United States. How do we engage um, with local voices and give local communities expression? And how do we create a dialogue among the local decision-making structures so that communities are able to work together and, and work out some harmony with what they are so that IATP is really interested in that level of democracy that agroecology promotes that looks over the border, if you like, and outside of the community into those who are connected to us through the ecosystem and through the food that we share. So democracy is really important to us and health, the overall system, ecosystem health and the health of those um, that are eating in it. So welcome everyone again and, and thank you for this chance to, to be with you today. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so unfortunately, our next speaker, uh, Michelle Pember, who was supposed to join us today, had a last minute issue and was not able to join us. But very fortunately, Magdalena Ackerman has kindly agreed uh, to join us and give a presentation on the depth of agroecology, how it's anchored in rights-based approaches. Magdalena is from Argentina and is with the Society for International Development and is based in Rome. She's part of the coordination committee of the civil society mechanism of the Committee on World Food Security on behalf of the NGO constituency. She is a member of the co-facilitation team of several CSM working groups and a key member for the working group on agroecology. Also, I would really like to encourage people to enter your questions in the Q&A section. But Magdalena, can we hear from you now? Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you so much to the organizers for, for inviting me to, to this event. And um, yeah, I don't think I will be able to transmit the wisdom of uh, Michelle Pimbert, but I hope I can at least uh, give an insight uh, on, on agroecology and maybe particularly speaking from a youth's perspective, no, uh, and particularly in the crisis we, we are now facing, uh, the climatic and environmental crisis we are facing, and how agroecology and, um, yeah, particularly for the youth, uh, is providing a response uh, to uh, adapt uh, to climate change and to reverse it as well and also to regain um, our roots uh, to uh, our territories. Uh, so I hope uh, through my, my short presentation, I will be able to transmit some of these messages. Uh, and I think uh, Sophia's presentation earlier uh, was, was really wonderful in providing uh, some examples. Uh, and she clearly um, illustrated how agroecology uh, is not only meant uh, to apply ecological principles to agricultural practices to address uh, climate change or biodiversity loss. Agroecology goes much beyond uh, these agricultural practices. 
because agroecology uh, aims uh, at a systemic uh, transformation of food systems. And um, for such a systemic transformation that is so urgently needed, uh, the, the transformation emerges, emerges and needs to emerge from, uh, from the role and the agency of uh, food producers and consumers themselves. Um, so the, the centrality actually of, of the role and agency of, of food producers as well as consumers uh, makes that agroecology is not only a practice, uh, Sofia also said this, agroecology is also a movement Agroecology is a science, and agroecology is knowledge and culture. And actually, food producers themselves are the holders of such knowledge and uh, the culture embedded in agroecology. Um, through agroecology, uh, food producers regain control and autonomy over their food production. Uh, they are able to decide um, the what, the how, the when uh, to produce food and how to consume it and how to produce it. But all of this is also goes uh, through uh, social equity and in full respect of, of our planet. And, and this is the pillar of agroecology, um, the respect of the common home that hosts us uh, every day. Um, so having uh, this in consideration um, and, and actually to, to achieve um, the agroecology, agroecological systems, um, agroecology at its core uh, has um, a social organization and, and structure uh, that implies actually a power shift uh, from corporations to food producers, to those who actually produce the food. And this power shift uh, that is embedded in agroecology, um, it also aims uh, to, to build socioeconomic resilience of communities, of communities that have historically produced food, and also um, maybe food producers that might want to come back to the rural territories and, and uh, start producing food again. Um, but understanding uh, this, uh, this power shift and, and the social organization and structure that agroecology implies, um, there are also several, um, let's say uh, requirements or, or implications that, that need to be in place uh, for food systems to, to be disinvolved uh, through agroecology. Uh, these implications are first and foremost access and control over resources. Um, they are fundamental for the communities that are producing food through agroecology. Also, as I said before, uh, food producers themselves are the holders of knowledge. Uh, and so recognizing that they are the holders of knowledge, this means that uh, food producers organizations uh, and communities um, that have historically produced food become actually the, the main vehicle to uh, transmit, to disseminate, and to uptake agroecology. And so once we understand that, uh, that this knowledge uh, must be transmitted through uh, food producers themselves, then uh, automatically we, um, we end up rethinking uh, methodologies of, on how to transmit the knowledge, how to disseminate it. And this means that the, me the methodologies for disseminating um, agroecological knowledge uh, needs to be horizontal. 
uh, and uh, one one good example of of the such methodologies are uh, for instance the farmers to farmers schools uh, also another implication of of agroecological transformation of food systems um, is that uh, communities um, regain autonomy and independence uh, of their food systems and they become um, independent from the corporate or industrial uh, dominant food systems. And this is done uh, through um, several um, several ways and uh, one of them uh, and yeah one important one is uh, the the elimination of reliance on agri on agrochemicals um, because not depending on agro on agrotoxics on agrochemicals producers uh, regain the autonomy over their production um, while uh, protecting their health, the health of the communities that are surrounding the food production um, and also uh, protecting the, the health of the environment. Um, also, um, in terms of autonomy, um, it's, it's uh, important to highlight um, the feminist perspective as well, no? Um, Agroecology has uh, provided pathways, powerful pathways to overcome uh, oppressive structures that um, are too much uh, are often embedded in, in the dominant industrial food systems. Agroecology um, struggles uh, and, and uh, reshifts from these uh, oppressive structures. Uh, for instance, peasant women um, in um, a lot of the regions of the world have a long tradition of, of plant breeding and adapting local seeds varieties uh, to changing environments and um, acknowledging that they have the knowledge, they have the tradition, they have the know-how uh, on how to adapt the seeds uh, then automatically um, women uh, regain their agency and their autonomy. Uh, there is a very interesting paper on uh, feminism and, uh, and agroecology, uh, which uh, I might share on the, on the chat later. Uh, and this really uh, gives a, a profound understanding on the links uh, between um, feminism and agroecology and how without feminism, there is no agroecology. So this is also a key aspect uh, of agroecology. Um, and um, last, uh, in terms of autonomy, is the, the and I think um, Sofia was also giving this uh, in great detail, was the autonomy of from global markets, no? Because agroecology, uh, the preferred uh, ways of distributing, selling, uh, or exchanging food, uh, the preferred ways are through short uh, circuits um, and such as uh, local markets or for instance, uh, community supported agriculture uh, that actually create a direct link uh, between uh, producers and consumers um, uh, themselves. Um, through all of this and considering the ecological principles of, of agroecology, um, agroecology uh, is, is pivotal also uh, for a better nutrition uh, and so better health and better environment uh, for communities. And um, so uh, concluding now, um, maybe the concluding message, but it, which is also the basis, no? Is that uh, all of these in implications that I have been mentioning are um, actually embedded in the struggle to, to fulfill, to protect um, and to respect uh, human rights. 
um, I was uh, talking about women's rights. I was talking about the right to adequate food, the right to land, the right the rights of peasants and uh, other people working and living in rural areas, right to health, right to a healthy environment as well, and so on. Um, because actually, uh, and it as it was mentioned in the beginning, agroecology is anchored on uh, the human rights framework. And so agroecology and um, the fulfillment of, of the human rights uh, framework in all its indivisibility uh, become then uh, the pillar for food sovereignty that we um, so urgently need. So thank you so much. I'm kind of liking this video function. People know it's time to, to close up. Um, thank you so much um, for that and also for doing it with such short notice. So we are going to have another poll. Uh, this one, we're going to ask people to finish the sentence, agroecology is, and then uh, we will share the results shortly. Um, there you go. So you can vote on whichever one makes sense to you and we'll share the results soon. So our next panel um, is about 20 minutes and we'll be talking about perspectives from several organizations from Third World Network, Pesticide Action Network, uh, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa and National Family Farm C Coalition about the, big, the biggest challenges their organizations are facing uh, for food and agriculture systems and why they think agroecological approaches represent the most comprehensive pathway for addressing those changes. Um, so our first presentation uh, will actually be a video presentation. So I'll let um, perhaps Colleen can post the poll results shortly, but just to introduce it, uh, we'll be hearing from Lim Li Ching from Third World Network, who unfortunately could not be with us today, uh, but sent a video for us to share. We asked her to share her thoughts on why an organization such as Third World Network, which is engaged in multilateral development goals on sustainability and spaces such as UN conventions on biodiversity and climate change, consider agroecological approaches as key to addressing these multiple crises. So perhaps, um, Colleen, if you can post the poll results, and then I think we will be going to this short video. So lots of answers across the board, which I suppose is one of the elements of agroecology, uh, that it is so many things. So we will start now with the, with the video from Ching. Hi, my name is Lim Li Ching and I coordinate the agriculture work at the Third World Network. We're an international policy research and advocacy NGO based in Malaysia. Thank you for the opportunity to provide our reflections on why agroecology offers the most comprehensive pathway to address multiple challenges and crises. We share this from our perspective as an organization that has consistently been engaging in multilateral governance spaces for over 30 years. Indeed, the world is facing worsening and interconnected climate, biodiversity, agricultural, health and economic crises. The pandemic has further laid bare and deepened the inequities of our food systems. There are systemic flaws and vested interests that underpin these crises and continue to prop up what is essentially a failing industrial, agricultural and food system. So my first point is, rather than tweaking unsustainable food and agricultural systems or just tinkering around the edges, we need to completely transform them, addressing root causes in an integrated way and providing holistic, resilient and long-term solutions. How do we do this? Firstly, we need to move out of conditions that lock in industrial agriculture. This means taking on the tough task of dismantling the incentives and corporate monopolies that have kept industrial agriculture in place. Then we need to undertake structural reform, that is, enabling a paradigm shift from industrial food system towards diversified agroecological systems. 
We need policies, institutions and investments that support a transition to agroecology. But why agroecology? This is my second point. Agroecology is an integrated approach that applies ecological and social principles to the design and management of food and agricultural systems. It optimizes interactions between plants, animals, humans and the environment. It includes socio-economic and political aspects that enable sustainable and just food systems. It has a unique holistic capacity to reconcile economic, environmental and social dimensions simultaneously. We know from the evidence that an agroecological transformation of agricultural systems is the most robust response to protecting biodiversity while promoting climate stabilization, healthy food, nutrition and diet, and systems resilience. There are numerous examples from around the world that conclusively show this, and farmers will be sharing their lived experiences in this webinar as well. Agroecology also supports circular and solidarity economies that reconnect producers and consumers. Territorial markets and short supply chains can enhance access to fresh, diverse and nutritious food ensure greater value to farmers and reduce vulnerability to disruptions on international markets. It is thus supportive of food sovereignty and livelihoods. Agroecology provides space for different trade and marketing systems that empower and allow small-scale and peasant farmers, indigenous peoples, women and rural and urban communities to flourish. During the pandemic, we have seen many such examples of communities coming together, providing food, short-circuiting long supply chains and building on community-supported agriculture. My third point, small producers, indigenous peoples and women in particular contribute immensely to agriculture and the diverse and resilient farmer seed systems and indigenous food systems are key foundations of agroecology. The rights of those who are at the forefront of the struggle and their rights over resources such as land, water and seeds have to be respected, protected and fulfilled. The various human rights instruments and standards have to be implemented at national levels. The current negotiations for a legally binding UN treaty on business and human rights could also play an important future role in reining in corporate excesses. How do other approaches compare? This is my fourth point. So-called nature-based solutions are not equivalent to agroecology they do not incorporate the full range of transformative changes that agroecology engenders, from ecologically sound practices to social and economic justice to respect for human rights agency and empowerment. Instead, through carbon offsets to mitigate climate change, so-called nature-based solutions facilitate the appropriation of forests and lands, threatening to dispossess the indigenous peoples, local communities and small producers who are the true stewards of the planet's biodiversity. Finally, we need to operationalize agroecology's principles of respect for farmers and traditional knowledge, and to enable deep changes in governance to foster equitable participation, empowerment and agency of peasants, women, fishers, livestock keepers, farm workers, those who produce and supply our food. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And I'm happy to see so many um, questions being raised now and documents being shared in the chat. Um, for our next speaker, uh, we have Marsha Ishii, who is a senior scientist at Pesticide Action Network North America, uh, PANA. So in addition to being a scientist for PAN North America, she's also the coordinator of the Agroecology Group for Pesticide Action Network International. So clearly you've identified agroecological transformation as key to your work. Can you say more about that? Hi, yes, thank you so much, uh, Karen, and welcome everybody. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you. I am going to share, oh, okay. Um, all right, great, well, uh, I'll begin by introducing PAN. PAN is a global network founded in the global south and dedicated to ending the devastating health, 
livelihood and ecosystem harms posed by chemical pesticides. And yes, absolutely, we see agroecology as the most comprehensive and powerful solution to the pesticide problem. Japan has been fighting the harms of pesticide dependent agriculture for over 40 years. Unfortunately, the reality today is that pesticide poisonings continue to affect millions of people every year. Um, next slide. A systematic review conducted by Pan and colleagues found that pesticides are responsible for an estimated 385 million cases of acute unintentional poisonings every year. And many of these have also been linked to an increase in chronic diseases such as cancers, um, developmental disorders, hormone system disruption, or reproductive problems. Yes, you can go ahead. 10 years of community monitoring by PAN UK showed that poisonings are widespread and prevalent around the globe, affecting from 40 to 80% of farmers and workers in the country surveyed. Next slide. The pesticide problem persists because, simply put, pesticides are very big business. Analysis by PAN partner Public Eye, shown here, revealed that CropLife International, this is the, globi the Global Lobby Association of the major pesticide multinationals, reaps over one third of its income from the sale of highly hazardous pesticides. Next slide or advance. It is in this, con actually the previous slide. Okay. Um, it is in this context that UN experts have called these pesticides a global human rights concern because of their catastrophic impact on the environment, human health, and society as a whole. These UN experts have identified the sale, export, and relentless pressure to use chemical pesticides as responsible for the violation of numerous human rights. And these include the right to health and to a healthy environment now, to safe working conditions, to adequate food and clean water, to a dignified life, and as well, in particular, the rights of indigenous peoples and also of women and children not to be exposed to or have to use hazardous pesticides. To defend these human rights, we need a transformation of the agri-food system and also of the political and economic structures locking us into the corporate industrial model. Indeed, 40 years ago, PAN's founders declared that the pesticide problem was part of a larger structural problem. And they specifically named corporate power and influence over our governments, as well as pressure from the international financial institutions and so-called development institutions. Next slide. Today, we are seeing even more corporate overreach at the UN, the United Nations, where the UN Food and Agriculture Organization last year announced plans to formalize a partnership with none other than CropLife International, while simultaneously backpedaling on its commitments to agroecology. And we invite you to join us in our campaign to block that partnership from moving forward. In contrast, what we know is that building a movement to end the harm of pesticides requires global organizing to demand systems change. We know from our experience that it is, it is never enough to simply replace one bad pesticide with another one that may turn out to be harmful in many other ways, while leaving intact a fundamentally flawed system that depends on the continuous exploitation of land and labor. Next. Agroecology, on the other hand, as we've been hearing with its ecological, social and cultural dimensions, its integration of knowledges and sciences, and its political analysis grounded in equity and justice offers not only a way out of the trap of pesticide dependence, but also a way towards building sustainable and equitable agri-food systems in which communities, not corporations, are at the center of decision-making. That is why we put forward agroecology as the solution to pesticide harms in all of the spaces where we are active as a network, whether in negotiating international policy agreements to phase out pesticides in Geneva or in Rome, or in calling for the redirection of public resources to support farmers' transitions at home, 
or in promoting workers' rights to define the conditions of their work. For pan agroecology, or we might say a plurality of agroecologies, is what can enable us to move towards a pesticide-free and liberatory future. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. That was great. Um, so our next panelist is Milion Belay, who is the founder of Melka Ethiopia and the general coordinator of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, or AFSA. He's joining us today from Kampala, Uganda. Both she and Marsha brought up the issue of rights. That's kind of central to the issue, concept of food sovereignty. So from AFSA's perspective, can you tell us how you see agroecological transitions as central to your work? Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Thanks for inviting me. Um, there's no light in Kampala now, so the room can be getting darker every minute. Um, so in uh, 2008, when we started the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, um, that one thing that we have agreed is to create a single and loud African voice on an issue that matters to us all. And the issue that matters to us all is agriculture, uh, because over 70% of our people depend on agriculture for their livelihood, and agriculture is a main economy for uh, most of our, uh, our countries. Uh, then question is, what kind of agriculture? As you know, there are competing paradigms in, 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 in agriculture. Uh, on one hand, you have uh, the green um, uh, the green revolution agenda, the industrial uh, agriculture agenda, focusing on uh, agrochemicals, high yielding varieties, and reorienting um, agriculture to to market to the needs of, to the vagaries of market, and all that. And I'm not going to go into that direction, but. Um, um, when we started to focus on agroecology around 2013, the level of understanding of agroecology among uh, members of AFSA and generally was not that huge and that deep. So we wanted to understand uh, what agroecology is, but we went to explore whether agroecology would answer uh, some basic and important questions for us, questions of productivity, Questions of health, questions of nutrition, uh, questions of the environment. You know, we want uh, an agricultural system who, who is friendly to the environment. Questions of cultural appropriateness. You know, the African is a um, uh, cultural hotbed, as you all know. And questions of uh, human rights and the right to food. So we did uh, collect cases from all over Africa. And uh, the cases, you know, when we do the meta level analysis of all these cases, we could see that, you know, agroecology ticks all of these boxes. So agroecology is very much important. And as our name implies, we are the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. Um, that's why we are also very much interested in the social movement side of the agroecology. Um, because, you know, food sovereignty politicizes uh, the food agenda. It talks about cultural appropriateness of food and it addresses gender issues um, and in the, the environmental sustainability issue and, and food security does not address all this. So currently where we are going is exploring um, spaces to really help help us to transition to agroecology in Africa. And uh, I would mention one or, one or two of these, these spaces. One is uh, we have a project which is called Healthy Soil and Healthy Environment, where we are involving uh, close to 20 African countries, uh, farmers in these 20 African countries, and we are linking them uh, with, uh, with the Andhra Pradesh uh, project, is community-managed natural farming project uh, in Andhra Pradesh. So, so there is a, a vibrant discussion of the soil building mechanisms uh, in all these farms, you know, uh, and uh, the linkage with, with, uh, with, with India. Uh, and also we are, explore, we are asking a question, what kind of market would help us to transition to agroecology 
and we have uh, decided to focus on, on territorial markets and we are uh, researching the territorial markets uh, in Africa and we are trying to link agroecological producers with consumers and also with the service providers. We are also uh, focused exploring how we can use the climate emergency situation for, uh, to transition to agroecology. So we are trying to uh, integrate agroecological agroecology into climate policies in Africa. And this is happening in, in 12 uh, African uh, countries. And before even the UNFSS started, we have started a, a, a food policy dialogue in uh, 24 African countries and, uh, and also at the, at the regional, at the African Union level. And, and these dialogues were happening in these 24 African uh, countries. Now we are doing the synthesis and, and uh, uh, influencing the African Union to consider an African food policy, which has agroecology at, as its center. And also we are uh, using the COVID situation also um, you know, as an opportunity to uh, educate uh, the, the policymakers about the importance of African food and African vegetables, African crops, including root crops, um, how nutritious they are. So we are considering that also as a policy space. And as you all know, also we are ramping up our media strategy and communicating through social media and other media spaces. We have a bigger grouping of also African media houses now to, to really uh, promote agroecology. So we are all, we are using all these spaces to, to promote uh, agroecology. And thanks Karen again uh, for, for inviting me to this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Milian. Um, as people, we have so many wonderful speakers today. It's really a shame that there's, so these are short presentations, um, but I do think they get to the heart of what different people are promoting. Um, we had hoped to hear from Jim Goodman from the National Family Farm Coalition in the US next. And it seems like there may have been some mix up. So perhaps we'll hear from him later, um, but I think we'll just go ahead and move on unless someone tells me he has appeared. Anyway, let's move on um, with another poll. Um, so before we hear the next panel, we'll be hearing from farmers around the world um, and about some of the impediments to agroecology. So here we've listed some of them um, and we would urge you to, to look at these polls, answer them, and we'll see sort of where the audience stands at this point. So in this next segment, uh, we'll hear from a, from a farmer from each of the five continents, sharing their stories on what made them adopt agroecological practices and what the impediments are that they face. Um, some of them will be speaking, uh, in one will be speaking at least one in Spanish. So be sure to have your interpretation button turned to the appropriate channel. Um, so we will start soon with Lucy Siwe. Um, Colleen, have people voted or should we give it a little more time? There Let's we go. Just a little bit. Oh, there we go. Oh, you popped it up. Um, I mean, of course, all of these issues are important, I would say. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so next, um, our first farmer is Busisiwe Mgarenzela. Uh, she's an organic agriculture farmer using agroecology principles to produce nutrient dense, sustainable food. She integrates her farming with free range chickens, affording the extra benefit of chicken manure for composting in addition to meat, chicks and eggs. She's a member of the South African Organic Sector Organization uh, based in Eastern Cape and is a member of the participatory guarantee system, a quality assurance system. Uh, she is an activist promoting traditional seed saving and was also trained as a nurse. Lucy Siwek, uh, what one thing made you adopt agroecological farmer? And if you have time, is there something that gets in the way? Greetings, thank you so much. Uh, I became an agroecology farmer in 2014. 
And agroecology is a system that produces diversity of nutrient dense food that offers natural immunity to individuals. And as a previous health practitioner, a nurse educator, I know the value of good nutrition in maintaining healthy societies and the diversity in choice of food according to cultural preferences that is embedded in care, health, ecology, and fairness. The lost culture in agriculture is restored in agroecology. I am an agroecology farmer. I am a wage farm worker in my farm, and I am a consumer of my farm produced food. And one thing that gets in the way of agroecology is inadequate information. A, that is a lack of access to viable and already available information on agroecology, on soil fertility, organic pest management, and lack of resources to make necessary remedies. Thank you. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, next, uh, we'll hear from Jason Lindsay, um, who is not only a farmer, but also works in the Southeast African American Farmers Organic Network in the United States. Uh, SAFON is a network of small and heritage black farmers uh, based in the US and he works as a resource coordinator. A former teacher, his farming journey began a decade ago with a backyard garden, a passion for justice, and a connection to his agri agrarian heritage. So Jason, can you tell us your experience of shifting to agroecology or what you call Afroecology? And what are the difficulties you've faced or continue to face as a beginning African-American farmer? What is one thing you'd like to see changed? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, um, I didn't really make the shift myself. I, I was, what I found out was I was practicing uh, agroecology, uh, Afroecology, um, just through spirit in the way and just trying to eat right and trying to provide the best for my family. Um, I was already practicing these things and aligned politically in a lot of ways. And I didn't know it until I really became connected with the Spanish speaking world. Um, in particular, uh, folk out of Puerto Rico. Um, and that's when I, you know, realized the really uh, language barrier that, that most uh, indigenous or black farmers, uh, in particular here in the Southeast of the United States, um, or practitioners of, of these type of practices, you know, align with these type of uh, this type of politic, um, but the vocabulary um, does not um, is not there. Um, we articulate in a very different way, um, but um, much like the um, technology that we're using here to uh, be able to translate um, languages from English to Spanish or from from English to French and things of that sort. Um, there's a much need within throughout the Southeast for indigenous black farmers to be able to um, understand just in what mighty ways are we interconnected. Um, I was already practicing these things, you know, looking at ways in which I could, you know, grow uh, without um, any uh, pesticides or anything like that. I'm looking for ways in which I can implement things and which will cut the cost of, of farming thing that sort which will allow me to be more of a service to my community. Um, these type of efforts were already aligned in me. And what I found, what I found in uh, finding uh, agroecology is a community to, to join at the hip with um, to fight this good fight. Um, but I think I've already stated one of the largest challenges that we are facing here um, in the Southeast is, is, is a vocabulary. I wouldn't even say language, but a vocabulary barrier. Um, in which um, this connects the black farmer of America um, from the peasant farmers across the world. Um, and it's an illusion that really doesn't exist because the practices and the politics that we all align with here today um, are there and they're intact. And the horror and the trauma is there as well, you know, um, but it's something that because we are stewards of the land, 
um, is a day-to-day -day healing process in relation. Jason, I'm sorry to interrupt. Could I have you speak up just a little bit more? Some folks are saying that um, they can't hear you that well, and we are all interested in what you have to say. I do apologize about that. Um, I'm trying to figure out where I said last, <laughs> uh, but I was uh, pretty much saying that, you know, um, as a black farmer here, um, in the Southeast United States, you know, there is an overwhelming um, aspect of um, farming being related to slavery. Um, there's an overwhelming aspect of this because big ag rules, in particular here in the flatlands of North Carolina, where I reside, big ag is so dominant. And so there's an illusion that we can't even grow without the assistance, quote unquote, of pesticides, herbicides, and all the rest of the sides. Um, so what there, what, you know, has been, you know, one of the ways in which I found a winning strike is just through demonstrating things of that sort and connecting this bridge, um, connecting um, the two sides with this language barrier, where we would call sharecroppers and other countries to call peasant, peasant farmers and things of that sort. All these things are direct things, and all these these principles that we stand behind in, in growing are direct things that 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 link us all. But that language barrier and that vocabulary barrier was what I will highlight as as something that we have to work through in the coming days. Thank you so much, and for keeping to time as well. Um, so our next panelist is from Europe. Um, we'll hear from Vincent Delobel, uh, who is a certified organic goat farmer based in, uh, based in Belgium. He describes his farm as an autonomous family farm, producing all the feed they need, processing all their milk into soft and hard cheeses on the farm, and selling most of the products directly to consumers. Vincent was involved with the ECVC, European uh, arm of La Via Campesina, when they were working for the creation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. Can you tell us why you and your family decided to shift to agroecology? And if you were to talk about one key change in support of agroecology, what would that be? Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, yeah, 25 years ago, uh, what brought my family to change his uh, yeah, farming practices is when we understood that the health of the soul, of the plants, of the animals, and ours were just one. And actually, we had yeah, health problems with uh, intoxication. And also, I was born with uh, malformation. And many um, farmers and their families are paying uh, yeah, a bit uh, huge uh, damage um, caused by pesticides um, exposition here in Europe. And it's un, um, unspoken and unstudied as well. And so, but individually, in the individual uh, farm families, um, health is the major issue that brought people to change their practices. And yeah, on the side, we had uh, important uh, soil compaction and erosion problems, uh, weed resistance to herbicides, um, the uh, increasing fragility of the health of all high performing performing animals and yeah but it's only when it hurt human health that uh, yeah the, the mind change happened and the, then the, the farming practices changed um, eventually it questioned our use of pesticides but more broadly speaking or uh, dependence on agro industries up and downstream the farm. So we changed our practices to seek for more feed autonomy, uh, producing our own feed on the farm instead of importing it, uh, reducing tillage, planting more trees, increasing soil organic matter, um, saving farm seeds, processing and selling our products uh, ourselves which, through of fair chains and also welcoming children and students on the farms. Um, no, uh, at the moment um, it has been recorded that more than 70 Euro 70 percent of the European farmers now engage spontaneously in one of these, um, let's say, more peasant-like farming practices. Um, 
the key uh, challenge, I think, um, and in my opinion, to go forward with agroecology is now that we have to globalize rights, rules, and protections mechanisms on, along the food chains. Um, the dominant system made us slaves. Uh, we, we do, as a European producer, operate on a distort, biased global food markets and chains uh, that pushes us uh, as, as a producer to produce more and more, to earn less and less and to help less and less sustainable practices. In the south of Belgium, here where I live, more than 25% of farmers have a negative income. Um, so it's very important to know that it's not because we are big producers that we are earning a decent income. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, and yeah, through food, the dominant system made us slaves uh, on different sides of the planet. And so uh, our motto is that there is no free citizen on an empty stomach nor there is a citizen fed in a healthy and sustainable manner without a free peasant. So we really have to claim that agroecology and peasants' rights are the warrants of democracy. Um, the global peasant movement, Via Campesina, we fought uh, to make um, our fundamental, fundamental rights to seeds, land, water, knowledge, but also a decent income, health and safety at work. Um, recognized on a UN declaration. And we, we had a great support from a broad coalition of NGOs, but also in the public opinion as a, um, this issue really talked to many, many people, not only it, it, as it go much beyond food. Um, so the challenge for me and for such a coalition of uh, organization, I think is to this continuous struggle to make uh, human rights and peasants' rights prevail on international trade agreements. Um, in law, it is, but in fact, it is not. And we have to fight for this to make it prevail. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next panelist is Marcela Calderon. Her presentation will be in Spanish. So if you need translation, be sure to uh, click that box near the bottom. Uh, Marcela Calderon is an organic farmer who lives in Baigorita in Buenos Aires province in Argentina. She works with her two brothers and her mother and produces agroecological wheat, processes their wheat flour agroecologically, grows vegetables and fruit trees, and raises sheep all through agroecological approaches. Marcella, what one thing made you and your family adopt agroecological farming? And if there's something, one thing you could highlight that gets in the way of practicing agroecology, what is it you would like to talk about? Well, to start, thank you so much for allowing us to share our experiences. Well, we come from the agro-industrial model, and it's been 10 years already that we're doing what would be agroecology. In all truth, I like to talk about the agriculture, about the culture of agro, for what it all means. Specifically, if we go with the etymology of the word, of agriculture, we have culture, to cultivate, of what is cultured. Culture takes me to the individual, takes me to the roots, takes me to identity, let's say. And I feel more identified with agriculture, with being a person who does agriculture, in Spanish, an agriculturer, more than with being an agroecologist, let's say. I feel that it expands, let's say, my lived experiences more, let's say, than talking about, about agroecology, no? And well, what is it that made us change models? We come from an agro-industrial model that, at the time, we were working 2,500 hectares with, let's say, forefront seed beds with forefront technology. And well, we started asking ourselves, let's say, which carrot were we chasing, no? This idea of working so many hectares made us nomads, and more, in our territory, where the extensions are wide, and then, well, we would spend a lot of time outside, and this made us start rethinking our quality of life, our well-being. And well, um, that's when we started to rethink and to feel that this model had us as slaves, that we were slaves to that system and that we were working for others and we weren't working for ourselves, no. 
and that the system itself, the agro-industrial system, had collapsed. Let's say the gains weren't the same, the economic result, let's say, was not the same. And then also this, of starting to become aware of the influences of agrochemicals, of what it was doing, let's say, to our environment, let's say, to our lives. And to the life of the place, the environment, nature, and well, when one starts moving through this awareness, one starts thinking, well, about this planet Earth, no? About what it means in hectares and in terms of the world's population. Why did we get this piece of Earth, no? About what we had to do with that piece. What to do with this opportunity we were granted to have this piece of Earth. What did we have to do? And well, that awareness, well, it made us start thinking about our values to consciously think about what we were going to plant, what we wanted to harvest. What quality of food did we want to produce? Whereas the industrial model generates, let's say, commodities, and the ecological agricultural model has, let's say, more agricultural values, focusing on the farmer, on family agriculture, it respects food, it focuses on food, food for all consumers. Today, all the food that we eat daily, the plate of food we have in front of us daily, comes from the hand of a farmer, a peasant, no? From family agriculture. And those were the thoughts, no? We started sharing. And to become aware that the industrial model focuses on power, it focuses on having. When in the agroecological model, in ecological agriculture, what prevails is the individual, the being, let's say, no? And well, the actual individual prevails. And in reality, well, let's say, with the obstacles we encountered, it was, well, a a little. And also with the lack of state policies where education doesn't prevail, where knowledge doesn't prevail, where the agroecological model or ecological agriculture, which has to do with that, no? Mainly with education, with wisdom, with this awareness, with what are we living for, no? What we must do and with what is really going to be the set of values we want to leave on our way through life. And with this, it's also important to know what purposes we're going to have, let's say, with women, and women for this transformation, no, to continue this process of transformation to improve the quality of life for every individual on the planet. Why? Because the woman is the nurturer. If we copy, if we look at the role of the female in nature, in nature, it's the female that nurtures, that feeds, who chooses how she educates her young. And well, I feel that's the role we have as women, as women farmers. It's about what quality of nutrition do we want for our children, our families, our environment. Not only in food, but in wisdom. In having beings prevail, having knowledge prevail, having flavors prevail, no? In the importance of choosing the food, no? That we're giving them, the quality of the food, no? The quality of the food. Food that is free of chemicals, of synthetics, and all that encompasses that handling, that manipulation of food. And I believe I will close with these two phrases, that agriculture needs to be recognized as an essential task for the community of the life of the land and the day that the work of those who work the land, which is the farmer, is empowered. And that, let's say, is it's recognized as the work of the future. The world will begin to change. And for now, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, one last question speaker on this panel who's from the Philippines, uh, Nong Eri Sasi. Is he there? If you can turn on your video, I want to make sure you, there you are. Okay, I see you popping up now. Uh, He is a farmer partner of the Southeast Asia Regional Initiatives for Community Empowerment since 1994. He is practicing diversified and integrated farming system in his own farm. Um, And he is the president of President Rochas Integrated Farming Association uh, in Mindanao, Philippines. Mr. Nong, what made you a farmer? Um, What made you as a farmer want to shift to agroecological practices? And what's one challenge you would like to see addressed? Thank you, Ma'am Karen. I hope my... Uh, audio is clear. So before I shift to agroecology farming, let me share you my experience upon the introduction of Green Revolution before. That, that was a uh, year 1970s. 
we have experienced an uh, outbreak of pests and disease in our farm due to excessive use of hazardous chemicals that create immunity to pests and the uh, imbalanced environment due to spraying that kills uh, um, beneficial insects that uh, um, uh, go against the, the harmful. So before I shift to agroecology farming, Sea Rice um, conducted training to us farmers here in the Philippines regarding the ecological pest management, whereby um, they teach us how to cult uh, control pest and disease through cultural control and biological control. Then they teach us the technique how to pre uh, um, protect the environment, uh, technique how to uh, culture different uh, uh, um, faces as a one of our uh, uh, integrated in our farm, the diversified and integrated uh, way of farming. So they also teach us how to breed. Um, this technology that was given to us, we also share it to our co-farmers in, in the farm. Um, important reason why I was encouraged to practice agroecological system because of these benefits, no? food security, health and safety of the human being as well as the uh, animals, environmental protection and conservation to make a balanced ecosystem, uh, climate uh, change adaption, so sustainable family income and uh, protection of uh, biodiversity. One problem why uh, we are um, hardly to, to advance agro agroecology system because of the introdu introduction of this new technologies. Uh, um, lack of government support uh, on organic and diversified farming example is in materials, the training and organic farming uh, technology, extension service related to, to agroecology, uh, inappropriate policies that favors large private companies and does not recognize farmer's shade system and the use of GMO. So uh, Agroecology system is of great uh, help to us. Uh, before we practice monocropping, then we experience this outbreak of um, pest and disease. So we uh, have a negative income. So thank you for, again for this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, so we will be going to our next and final panel today, um, discussing some of the impediments to agroecology and what's happening to support the advancement of agroecology with an eye to policy. Uh, so our first speaker is Nina Muller. She is Associate Professor at the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience based in the UK. She's interested in a wide range of transdisciplinary approaches to agroecology, food systems, and environmental challenges, uh, especially but not limited to subsistence, livelihoods, and agrarian change. Uh, she, along with colleagues from Agroecology Now, were the lead authors in a recent study on development finance for agroecology. Hi there. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I hope. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you so much for having me today. There we go. Okay. So this panel was asked particularly to consider impediments to agroecological transition. 
And, and to do so, one of the things that, that I think we really need to look at is, is funding money. And, and what I want to do today is, is show you some data on, on what money flows actually to agroecology, what, what actually goes. So despite an increasing recognition and a plethora of international reports, organizations and platforms, all pointing to agroecology as a crucial part of the solution, we have clear evidence that actual financial support for an agroecological transition remains really minimal. And in 2018, Michelle Pimber and I concluded um, our first study on UK aid. Um, and since then, there have been a number of other analyses focusing on development aid from European countries. And as you can see here, the, the, red, the, the green slice refers to funding that contributes to an agroecological transformation. And with the exception maybe of Switzerland, funding for agroecological transformation remains really very, very small. And earlier this year, there was another study that was published um, on Dutch ODA, um, development assistance, which shows again that only 4% of Dutch aid flows are supportive of agroecological transformation. So at this stage, you might potentially ask what actually counts as supportive of agroecological transformation and what doesn't. So before I throw another handful of pie charts at you, which I will, um, I'm just going to show, want to quickly explain that, that all of these analyses make use of Stephen Gleesman's five levels of food system change, which many of you might, will be familiar with. And so this moves from increasing the efficiency of industrial practices and then via substituting less harmful practices and redesigning the agroecosystem to building an equitable and sustainable global food system. That's the sort of trajectory. And, and these analysis consider projects that adopt efficiency oriented approaches at level one. So for example, sustainable intensification to represent conventional agricultural approaches. Efficiency improvements are really of integral concern to conventional agriculture, and they cannot be said to contribute to an agroecological transformation. The projects at level two, which focus on substituting environmentally harmful inputs with ecological alternatives or practices, are considered a sort of intermediary step away from conventional agriculture towards transformative agroecological change. And only projects at level three or above fully contribute to transformative agroecology. Okay, so that should give you a little bit an idea of the of the concept we've been using. Nina, so back to some graphs. Yes, could you speak just a little bit more slowly for our translators? Yes, sorry Thank about you. that. I'm rushing through because I want to um, impart all this information. Um, so this chart analyzes the green climate funds agricultural portfolio. And you can see again that we're looking at very small amount of funding, or maybe we should actually say that we're looking at overwhelming support for the industrial agricultural paradigm. Um, and the, the GCF, in case you don't know, is responsible for funding climate adaptation and mitigation in developing countries. So you, that is maybe quite disappointing. And the picture looks similar in the case of the agricultural funding made available by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the money received by and spent in Kenya on agricultural research and development. Again, the green slice denotes agroecological support. Um, and, and this is the study by BioVision and IPES Food. And finally, just one more detailed look at the EU money that is being spent. And again, you can see that none of the money that was spent in the three years between 2016 and 2018 via the FAO, via the International Fund for Agricultural Development and via the World Food Programme is fully supportive of agroecological transformation at this level three, at this fully transformative agroecology. The 2.7% that were made available actually only supported projects at level two. All these studies underline the necessity of shifting both international development assistance and climate finance away from supporting an agricultural sector that is geared towards large petrochemical dependent agribusiness. 
and shifting it away from that towards an agroecological transition. I don't know if I have time to conclude with the last final thought. Very quick. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, there is, in order to be supportive of an agroecological transition, an increase in funding needs to be backed by changes in the mode in which this funding is made available to agroecology. So for example, some studies show that public private partnerships are not efficient ways to finance smallholder agriculture and large grants are not the solution either. So what we need is a divestment in industrial agriculture and corporate food systems and a complete cessation of public funds in support of large agribusiness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Um, so next we have Francesco Ajena. Um, and I understand it's his birthday today. Is he around? Thank Please you. Tur turn on your video. So uh, I'm trying, uh, but I'm unable. Oh, okay. Well, it can be without the video. Uh, okay. So Francesco right. is an international consultant uh, specializing in agroecology. He currently works at the International Fund for Agric or Agricultural Development, EFAD, and UNFAO. He's also, uh, since 2017, worked for the, uh, as policy advisor for the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IPES Food. So Francesco, with all of these different roles, um, You've been trying to advance agroecology. What are your recommendations to policymakers? Okay, thank you, thank you, Karen. So I'll try. <laughs> it's a very complex topic, and, and I only have four minutes, so I'll try to go through it uh, as quickly and clearly as possible. So, uh, as we have seen, as we know, the the dominant industrial food system have co-developed with, uh, with the policy environments that actually have uh, ensured that uh, the industrial food systems uh, uh, remain in place. And um, in order to, uh, for those innovations that we've been hearing uh, very interestingly today, both social and technical innovations, farmers trying to implement agroecological transitions uh, we absolutely need an enabling an enabling policy environment uh, to uh, for, for those innovation to be successful. But nowadays we, we have everything but uh, an enabling policy environment. We have exactly the contrary, which is a, a policy environment that is locking the food systems into uh, the the industrial models, which, as we know, are not delivering any of the urgent global challenges that we have. So the link between agroecology and policy has increasingly gained attention in food systems debate. We have seen many countries uh, and regions, including in the European Union, uh, um, discussions about how we should uh, uh, implement agroecological policy taking place. And, and, and um, an academic debate also that's increasingly uh, uh, giving attention to, the, to this topic. Uh, we do have differently from the organic movement a, a sort of uh, bigger obstacle, which is the fact that in the agroecological movement in general, uh, people are uh, reluctant to implement regulations aimed at labeling the production, production processes and products as agroecological. So this is of course, from a policymaker's point of view, an obstacle in order to implement those policies that should be uh, enabling or creating a, a level playing field for, for agroecology. So the first of the takeaway or the messages that I wanted to give is that in order to design agroecological policy, I think we have started this discussion indeed when I was working with IPES Food and with the, and, and participation with a coalition at the European Union level of more than 50 NGOs working in, uh, in food systems. We have started these discussions and we have come out with a very basic but important I think consideration is the fact that in order to design agroecological policies and agroecological transformations from a, a, govern, a public governance point of view, we should start from what we have. And what we have are the 10 elements of agroecology that have been voted and adopted by, by the FAO Council and the principles also that are very clear as, uh, um, as uh, um, explained and described in the HIP report. Uh, um, on, on agroecology and, and other innovations. So the 10 elements that, that many of you or all of you already know are 
the, the define the characteristic of agroecological systems, but also uh, from an, uh, an, an agro agronomic point of view, but also the social characteristic, the economic ones, and they represent a promising tool to design the policies uh, that, that should be or can be uh, um, creating that uh, level playing field and enabling policy environment for, for agroecological innovation to spark. Another important thing which um, uh, I have been researching on and, and discussing also uh, with, with, uh, with FAO is the um, uh, importance of promoting uh, integration of the different policies. And this is something that also uh, IBES Food has been working on uh, in 2019, indeed, with, uh, with uh, an important report on for a common food policy for the European Union, a sort of integrated food policy package approach to uh, transform uh, European food systems. Agroecology promotes the integration at different levels, from the farm scale to the landscape, but I also think ultimately ultimately, it promotes the uh, integration also at the food governance of the food systems level, like promoting integrated food policy. It's really something that comes out from the whole approach, systemic approach that agroecology has. And policy packages or integrated food policy have an important uh, an important thing. First of all, they, they can address the the nexuses and the synergies and minimizing the trade-off between different policies that are addressing, um, that are regulating different aspects of food systems from economic policies and social safety nets, uh, um, policies uh, uh, that are aimed at uh, um, subsidize agriculture and so on and so forth. So a systemic approach because food systems are systems and they need systemic approach in order to be changed because they have been shaped again within uh, an industrial uh, food system model which need to be changed. So we need to address it in a systemic manner. But from a, a policy perspective, I think what is also important to mention, and there has been, I'll be putting a link in the chat later, and, and I think a very interesting article in Nature Food a couple of years or one year ago uh, regarding political feasibility. Political feasibility is very important. I, I have been working as an as a, as a policy advisor for a Green Party, which was very much in favor of, of an agroecological transition. But you still have, even when we are in favor, even when agroecology is a part of your program, you still have the problem of, of do you have, do I have the political capital in order to, uh, to implement uh, certain uh, reforms that are very ambitious in most of the cases, because we really need to shift uh, uh, and somehow drastically towards uh, sustainable food systems. Policy packaging have been proved in that study to be in, in to be enhancing. The, sorry, we're going to need you to I'm wrap going up. To, I'm going too far. Yeah, sorry. So political feasibility, policy packaging, and, and, and having a systemic approach at the policy level can really increase the political feasibility. And then, so as been mentioned, from a policy perspective, where are we getting the money in order to, to implement those reforms? There has been another important report recently published by FAO, UNDP, and UNEP that flagged how much, but we already knew that, the money going into agricultural support is actually a wrong investment and how much do we need to repurpose that. So we do have the money to implement those policies. We just need to, uh, to, 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 to change, to shift the focus and, and investing in, in, in food systems policy approaches can be a very uh, promising way to repurpose all that money. Thank you very much. Or... Thank you. I feel terrible cutting people off because these are all such great presentations, um, but we will be sharing the recordings and, and hopefully we can all be in touch in the future as well. Um, our next panelist is Timothy Wise. Uh, Tim is a senior advisor at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and also a senior research fellow at Tufts University's Global Development and Environment Institute, where he founded and directed its Globalization and Sustainable Development Program. He also served previously as Executive Director of the US Aid Agency Grassroots International. Tim, you were very involved in a recent campaign asking governments to redirect funding away from AGRA. Can you share some of your thoughts on that campaign? Sure. Thanks, Karen. Um, thanks to everyone for these uh, amazing presentations. Um, such a collection of of impressive and um, and diverse perspectives uh, and experiences. Um, I'm, it, it, to me, it really represents the 
the diversity that we're all looking for in the food system as well. Um, the the briefly the I, I think um, going directly off of what um, Nina was presenting. Um, the the research that I've done and some of the work with um, African civil society organizations such as Mil Million Bele and the um, uh, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, the Southern Africa um, Faith Communities um, Environment Institute, um, it has focused on the the need to disrupt and um, and redirect the funding that is now being devoted to um, to industrial agricultural systems in Africa that looks a lot like uh, the Green Revolution in Africa, um, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, funded mainly by the Gates Foundation, but also by USAID, by uh, UK Aid, by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, has gotten $1 billion in funding. And our research has shown that in 15 years, it has produced um, mediocre results, even in its own narrow terms. Productivity has gone up barely more quickly than it, than it did before, um, before uh, the Green Revolution push started again in 2006. Poverty is still endemic in rural areas. And uh, most alarming, um, in AGRA's 13 focus countries, um, hunger has had the number of undernourished people has gone up 30 percent and that was before the pandemic hit and that was before um, uh, the most recent alarming statistics showing that across sub-saharan africa um, uh, the the amount the number of undernourished people has actually increased 50 percent since agra started um, in 2006 far from its goal of cutting food insecurity in half. It is actually taking Africa in exactly the opposite direction. What makes this um, so relevant um, to, uh, as, an, as an obstacle to, the, to agroecology, which some of the civil society groups, such as uh, AFSA, have been advocating for many years, is that it's very difficult to open a lane in government, um, both the policy lane and, um, a, and, and a funding lane for supporting agroecological processes if, those, uh, if the Green Revolution approach is gobbling up all of the resources, and it does. And the donors are not the only or maybe the biggest problem here. African governments themselves are spending huge amounts on um, subsidizing the purchase of exactly these Green Revolution inputs, uh, commercial seeds and fertilizers. The government of Malawi in some years has spent 60% of its entire agricultural budget on um, seed and fertilizer subsidies. Those for subsidies end up going through farmers, but they end up going directly, indirectly to companies. Monsanto is in now Bayer is the largest provider of um, of commercial maize seeds in Malawi. Um, they are the beneficiaries of these policies, um, which sort of brings me back to the the obstacles. Um, to the implementation of agroecology. Um, we need to, um, uh, to interrupt this commitment on the part of donors and governments to this failing model. And our research shows it is failing. Um, but beyond that, um, we need to, uh, we need to uh, uh, direct our attention to the corporate power that lies at the root of these policies. Um, uh, corporate concentration has increased in the food sector dramatically. Seed, seed mergers um, and takeovers, continuing to consolidate an industry that's already consolidated, that produces political power that's more concentrated as well. And that is a challenge, but, but one that groups like AFSA are very strongly 
fighting back against. And they stood up um, with a, a direct challenge, a public letter um, that IATP helped uh, co-sponsor um, to all agri donors demanding that they cease funding for green revolution programs and for agri. That is out there now. And um, we plan to direct our attentions to our own government and where uh, and challenge their commitment to to these continued and failing efforts to try to open a lane for agroecology. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Cecilia Elizondo, uh, who worked with the Argentine government for over 10 years uh, before becoming part of Mexican academia over two decades ago. She served um, in the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources in Mexico and continues now with the academic staff of, of the Agroecology Group at El Colegio de la Frontera Sur. Uh, her presentation will be in Spanish, uh, so please be sure you have the translation thing selected. And we'll hear from Cecilia on the efforts to advance agroecology uh, through national policy initiatives in Mexico. Thank you. And just to clear things up, in the translation, it said that I was Minister of the Environment, but no, I was Assessor Coordinator. It's like Chief of Cabinet of Environment from 2019 to 2020, just to clear that up. Well, here in Mexico, the national policy to control external systems in agriculture, the gradual reduction of glyphosate and transgenic, as well as agroecological transition, goes well beyond a policy in the agricultural sector, like many here have been mentioning. It's not just about a technical piece or a single sector. Here I make a parenthesis to also mention that many may have heard, like Tim was saying, the importance of the strength of civil society to form a resistance against all, those, all these corporations. There have been articles in the press which compare it to David versus Goliath, the topic of winning before Mexico's Supreme Court of Justice, the topic of the ban, of keeping the ban on transgenic corn, it is a struggle. It was a struggle by this organization called Collective Demand Against Transgenic Corn. And it was almost a decade long struggle. And there were over 50 people involved in this group and who led this resistance. It started in 2013. But it is also true that the actual circumstances offered by the federal government in Mexico now, hmm, has also helped make this happen because previously there was support for these corporations. And I don't know what the result would have been if said control by these corporations was still on the government. So since the start of this administration in February 2017, a group was formed, an intersectoral group of health, nutrition, environment, and competitiveness, with a goal in mind to transform the food system, like the name of this webinar, From Production to the Plate, From the Fields to the Plate. Aware that the present system is completely unsustainable, aware that it caused the degradation of natural resources and its ecosystemic services, that it contains commercialization and distribution mechanisms, and its supplies are exclusionary and inefficient. And in addition, it generated a malnutrition epidemic as a consequence to the health of the Mexican population due to the high consumption of highly processed foods and sugary drinks. This group has different departments related to the food system, the Department of Health, the Department of Labor itself, the Council for Science and Technology, and they also form a part of international bodies. It also includes the Institution of Indigenous People. And in these three years, that Secretariat of Environmental and Natural Resources has already been working. It has, on one hand, managed to create the federal law to protect and promote native corn, which is why I mentioned that there were circumstances which provided the judges in the Supreme Court of Justice with a solid legal foundation to tell the corporations, no, that there is a law which promotes and protects native corn, which was approved in 2020. On the other hand, we also have the presidential decree to gradually and progressively substitute and ban glyphosate by 2024. And in addition, it bans the entry of transgenic corn. There are already two fundamental documents to offer a legal basis so the Supreme Court could rule that way. In addition, there's the labeling in front of food products, which was approved in November of 2019 and went into effect in October of 2020. 
And in that short period of time, less than a year, companies that produced ultra-processed foods changed more than a thousand formulas for their food products, so they wouldn't have so many labels, so things can be changed. And that is already a direct gain from this measure of adding front labeling. Additionally, there's the national strategy towards an agroecological transition, and all this about there being no support for agroecology, we know it, and we have fought it in the Council for Agri-Food Security, so this could happen. In the documents of policy recommendations on agroecology, we were not successful. But here, well, the Department of Agriculture is supporting more than 2 million farmers, field workers who are working towards an agroecological transition. In addition, the Sembrando Vidas program, Planting Lives, is no longer benefiting any toxic agrochemicals in the production of plants. They not only produce plants and trees, but also agroforestry systems, coffee systems, systems of different products which are being supported. There's a training platform to lead to the agroecological transition, which just came out about a month ago which is part of all these institutions, the Department of Education, the Department of Economics, the Council for Science and Technology, and several other institutions. And in this platform, they can. It's a free platform that is not only for public servants, but also for the general public to use. Additionally, there is a campaign which starts with the President of the Republic for healthy nutrition, also with day workers on the topic of COVID. They have worked with the Department of Labor to improve this. There is a course on healthy living in schools, and then, as we can see, it's a joint effort. The Undersecretary of Mexico, Victor Suarez Cabrera, in the last meeting, the 49th of the Food Security Council, he made a clear call that it's necessary that we have a global regulatory framework transformation and that we use the example of Mexico to see what can be done globally. And if we don't make that regulatory framework for the food systems throughout the whole world, we are not going to successfully change this infamous system, which we have and comes with a recharged green revolution. I really wish we had more time. And in fact, I would encourage uh, if the speakers can stay on just a few minutes after the hour, we'd like to answer at least some of the many great questions that have come up. So our final speaker is Alberta Guerra from ActionAid, uh, who will, Alberta is senior policy analyst with ActionAid USA and leads uh, ActionAid's advocacy at the UN Food Agencies. Um, we'd like Alberta to talk about recent discussions <clears throat> at the, the Committee on Food Security on the definitions of agroecological principles and um, how you see that playing out as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and uh, thank you to the participants. Um, uh, well, first of all, just to to, to, um, to say that ActionAid is part of organizations that actively support agroecology, of course. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a really honor to be in this panel. Uh, and, uh, and ActionAid was also very supportive of all the process um, that uh, took place within the CFS in the negotiation of the policy recommendations. And um, uh, so let me start with uh, just trying to organize my intervention to keep in the in, in four or five minutes. Uh, so first of all, the, the fact that uh, the CFS um, uh, recognized uh, uh, and included agroecology on the agenda and we embarked in this negotiation process was at the time a big result and was a step in the pathway to uh, scale up agroecology in the political agenda of donors and governments. Uh, this effort started with the uh, first FAO International Symposium that was held in 2014. Uh, then the second International Symposium organized by the FAO as well in 2018. And then we got this uh, agroecology uh, in the agenda of the C Committee of World Food Security um, uh, work plan. And, and that time it was on the one hand a big result because this um, showed the increased um, interest and the recognition uh, that agroecology uh, had to be dealt with uh, in the highest UN space. On the other hand, um, since the beginning, I mean, it started with many, many challenges because uh, uh, US and other agri-export countries first tried to 
block this decision and to just prevent CFS from uh, tackling and discussing agroecology. But then when, the, uh, when this proved impossible, what they uh, we did and uh, unfortunately managed to, to get in was to um, uh, address agroecology and other um, uh, agroecological and other sorry, innovative approaches. So basically the, the approach they adopted was to, okay, let's not focus on agroecology only, but uh, let's try to associate agroecology with other practices, which uh, all we know are not sustainable. Uh, so they try to push for GMOs, for climate smart agriculture, sustainable intensification. And unfortunately they managed to do that because since the beginning, the process started with this uh, framework. So we couldn't have a process entirely focused on agroecology, but we uh, have had always to coexist um, with this ambivalence. And unfortunately, this is also, I mean, this was reflected in the final outcome. The, the policy recommendations have been negotiated and uh, uh, the negotiation concluded in May, they were approved uh, in June. Um, and even if there are some good elements, uh, what, uh, what is there is that first, uh, it's not as progressive as we have expected uh, as a civil society. Um, and in some parts are, um, might be really even dangerous for advancing agroecology, especially in the language around agrochemicals. Um, and, uh, and this was the result of having this forced coexistence between agroecology and other practices and uh, also the political context, because we, I mean, the, the, in, the, in the CFS, but not just the CFS, we know that many uh, governments um, were not supporting agroecology, some others were supportive of like a narrow um, vision of agroecology, so um, not, oh. for example, rejecting the issue of agency and the Alberta? role of peasant. Yes? Could I have you slow down just a little bit for our translators? Oh. Thank you. Sorry, apologize, <laughs> apologize. <laughs> Um, so um, in the in the recommendations, uh, there were some concepts that were rejected, like the um, ecological footprint, the concept of true cost and counting, um, in favor of concepts like synergies, compensation, uh, minimization of risks, uh, optimization. So these are all concerns. Of course, I mean we have also to recognize that. Uh, this recommendation in some parts might be useful, particularly to advance agroecology, maybe not just to advance, but to open some space to discuss about uh, agroecology uh, and its potential in, in transforming the food system in the more conservative spaces and governments, because of course, I mean, the, uh, this is a, an, an institutional and uh, intergovernmental agreed framework uh, recommendations so that they can be used. Uh, but at the same time, so we need to be very conscious about the limitations, the shortfalls, and also about the fact that uh, there are some language that in the end, it's really unacceptable uh, because agroecology can't coexist with agrochemicals. And, um, uh, and, and, and of course, this, is, uh, this can, can be ignored. Um, at the same time, I mean, another point that I would like to stress that uh, other panelists uh, highlighted before uh, the FAO 10 elements, uh, the HLP 13 principles, um, the CFS policy process starts with uh, a report by the high level panel of experts. And the high level panel of experts produced this report on agroecology and other innovation, innovative approaches. And they did a really amazing job in trying to. Um, 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 keep the original concept of agroecology, the concept has developed by social movements, particularly uh, anchoring to the 11 principles from the Nieleni Forum that social movements organized in 2015, um, but also did a great job in also to try to um, um, establish a framework to assess all the approaches and uh, um, uh, help navigate this forced coexistence and uh, come up with a result with the outcome that agroecology is the best 
solution to address the multiple crises and to move towards a sustainable food system. So um, my last point is that, um, of course, I mean, uh, we, need, we need to continue to stress uh, the FL10 elements and the 13 HFP principles as the framework that we want to use, um, and particularly to avoid the risk of cooptation. Uh, to be sure that any initiative that wants to support agroecology at political level is anchored to the right concept of agroecology, and also uh, to support the shifting um, of funding and the development of policies that are supportive of the real just for <laughs> agroecology. Sorry to rush. Right. I tried to really right. <laughs> squeeze my intervention in for me. I know. I Thank so you. wish we had more time. Um, we're going to pass on. I'm going to pass on to my colleagues, Shiny and Vincent, for a couple of questions and answers, but then uh, we hope to pass on the wide array of questions to the panelists uh, to follow up in written form later as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for this uh, being part of this uh, webinar, and, and thank you to stay till the end. Um, Shiny, I will give you the floor for the first question, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, delighted to be joining on camera with everybody. Uh, and for this, this last part of the webinar, uh, and happy to be joining uh, once or here. So we have very little time left to answer more than 23 questions. So clearly we won't be able to go through many of them. Uh, just take a couple of them and uh, I was just thinking that many of the speakers have identified corporate power as a big challenge. And I see that one of the question is specifically deals with that, where it identifies what the, from Walter Penguin. He says that one of the main threats to agroecological movement is uh, co-optation, uh, where agroecology is emptied out of its holistic content, especially taking only one part. And it, it is absolutely true that uh, that this cooptation at that time, it basically pays maybe a little bit of attention to the biophysical aspects and leaving out everything else. So the field of ag agroecology has been evolving over the decades because of the open-mindedness of those engaged in the study of it and uh, those engaged in the practice of it. And I feel that those trying to co-opt the term seems to be stuck in the 60s or even earlier where it was basically about biophysical aspect. And you know, it is definitely shows the close-mindedness of the, the community rather than anything else, I, I feel. Anyway, so today, the, as the panel one show, uh, what people were talking about, agroecology has evolved to, at a time of this increasing global food insecurity uh, as a solution to help multiple crises. And so the question from Walter is, how do the speakers in the countries deal with this cooperation, given uh, companies, governments, and other sectoral movements, or um, and even FAO and UN itself? What strategies do we have to sustain it and not fall into the trap of uh, getting co-opted, agroecology getting co-opted? And so a number of people over here can um, answer this. Maybe I will ask Marcia from panel one to answer this question. Thank you. Marcia. Yeah. Thank you, Shani. Yes, and yeah, many others have a deep experience in this. Uh, yes, I, it's a very important question. I would say that we cannot cede our public policy spaces to these corporations. And so we need to organize and call out and reject where we see this corrupting influence happen. So as I've mentioned and dropped into the chat, there are ways that we are organizing PAN as well as many of the organizations on this call have joined us in a global campaign to stop the UN FAO's alliance with CropLife International. And it is not just about stopping pesticide company influence at the FAO, but that is really emblematic or symptomatic of what is happening we are seeing happening in across the UN in many spaces so it's important to 
make clear to draw a line in the sand, so to speak, and uh, expose that this is going against all the expressed needs um, in violation of the human rights uh, that we've been talking about. At the same time, I think it's very important that we, while we fight these battles, that we also build up from the ground up and support the local transitions that are happening, that we support local farmers, that we support workers, campaigns for workers' rights. And we can do that by you know, both organizing at the local level. There are some very exciting um, developments uh, with uh, very participatory democratic food policy councils. Um, for example, you can look up what's happening in Valencia, Spain. Um, there's work happening at the provincial and municipal levels in many parts of the of the world. So building up and being in solidarity with farmers and workers in the food system to defend their rights and to you know, invest our own resources, you know, as mutual aid, as local to local. Um, we cannot wait, as I think someone mentioned uh, in the chat, for these global policy changes to take place. We need to build um, together um, relationships, one to one, direct community to community. And at the same time, we still need to expose um, these these um, what is happening in these spaces in the for for someone based in the United States here on Turtle Island. We also have a responsibility to challenge and stop our own government from interfering in the sovereign decisions of countries like Mexico um, and the the forward attempts and, and efforts by, say, Senegal to promote agroecology. And Tim Weiss has written quite a lot about this. So we have um, many ways in which we can engage and um, we have a responsibility to also uh, interact with our own policymakers at local and national levels. And also just one last thing, we do need to stop this double standard by which um, northern industrial countries in particular are exporting banned pesticides to the global south. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, I don't know if there is another panelist who want to react to this question. Or we go to another one. I see no hands. Okay, I would like to ask a question and, and mainly for the, the uh, farmers. Uh, perdón. Eh, eh, yo solo sí quisiera decir, hemos analizado mucho este tema eh, y eh, justamente lo que hemos platicado y lo que mencionamos es que la, eh, la cooptación no puede llegar al territorio. Entonces, aparte de que trabajemos a nivel global, sí el trabajo territorial, así como Marcela misma comentaba desde Argentina, ellos estaban totalmente cooptados por la eh, eh, en, en agroindustria, sin embargo, ellos toman la decisión de hacer un cambio. Entonces, si logramos esos cambios desde el territorio, es muy difícil que esos territorios puedan ser cooptados nuevamente. Nada más. Gracias. Thank you very much. No other panelists wants to react to that? No. OK, I would like to ask another question. And first, I, I think it's, it's for, the, for the farmers. Um, in the chat and in, in the Q&A Q uh, panel, um, there was some question about how can we engage more people in agroecology because one of the main elements for farmers is to get money, you know. Uh, so uh, how can we make them more uh, engaged into agroecology because agroecology connects to other issues that maybe they don't know. And that's linked to another question that how can we um, make the youth engage into agroecology. And, Yes, I, I think it would be great to hear a farmer who made that switch so that he can maybe understand, uh, explain to us. And I don't know, I can give the floor to Jason if you're still there. I am, I am. Um, I'm sorry, could you restate the question? Was I was saying, okay, sorry. I was saying that in the chat, many people were, were saying that how can we make, how can we engage more people into agroecology? Because 
one of the main elements for a farmer at the end is still money. And, and so agroecology is still not competing, I would say, uh, or it's complicated to, to get the, that money. And the other question is how, to, how we can, can we make the, the youth engage into agroecology? Because if we want to make the switch into a world where agroecology would be the, the main uh, approach to, to food system, we need to, to make people engage into it. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry I can't come on by video. My connection is acting up a little bit, but I think I understand your question. Um, I think the answer is clear. You know, when I came into agriculture, you know, almost a decade ago now, um, not even understanding the terminology around agroecology, um, but understanding it on, on a spiritual base, on a, on a land connection base, um, there were no pathways uh, for me to travel. You know, um, I had recently came out of college. So going back into, you know, the collegiate world and accumulating more debt was just out of the question. You know, I had started a family and things, you know, so there were, so I think the answer is clear and, it, and in a lot of ways today have been addressed and looking at the ways that agroecology is being resourced. Um, there has to, we have to create pathways for people to travel. We have to create, you know, these safe havens um, through our um, land-based institutes. You know, now when I say land-based institutes, I'm not necessarily saying a university, and I'm neither am I excluding them. You know, um, but I'm saying like safe havens within our community. You know, farms in which we're actually, you know, growing together, healing together and uh, and being able to provide and have something to protect you know um, these aspects of training have to have to be laid forth it has to be a curriculum based we have to steep our children in this um, I, I believe it was uh, Frederick Douglass who said I'd rather train up the children than the retrain men so I think our best bet in actually coming out triumphant which I believe we will uh, because we are connected and, and we really, through these fights, are speaking for the land in, in these languages that, that, me, that many um, misconceive. Um, so we have to open up pathways uh, for our youth to be able to travel through. There has to be direct connecting points in which we can touch, which our youth will be able to touch. And I feel the younger that we start that, the better off that we'll be. Thank you, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, I don't know if there is another uh, person on the panel who would like to give it his. Yes, Vincent. Oh, yeah. uh, that's Busisiwe from from South Africa. As I've written on the chat, uh, on on the chat, as a like now when I said. Sometimes there is a much of the information is there for us to access. But they don't know that the information because sometimes the language or the methods they, that the information is a, is set into is not even like friendly to the farmers. And they remind you, most farmers that are agroecology are coming from the rural areas. So if we, we do campaigns and use these organizations, like I've say, as I've made an example, that is representing a lot of different groups, uh, whether it's religion, whether it's traditional uh, uh, leaders and uh, uh, policy makers and everybody to know. And because there's a lot of information that is there, but people are not aware. And uh, and uh, and uh, you know, use the old uh, material, your newspapers, the books, the schools, the radios, to disseminate this information to farmers, so that then uh, people are aware of agroecology. And you know, the farm farmer to farmer schools and farmer to farmer visits, farmers speaking about their successes, so that then they know that here is a farmer who is doing this. Here, like me, it's just like me, but she's succeeding in this uh, agro ecology thank you thank you very much uh, i will now give the floor to marcella and then uh to shiny to wrap up or maybe another question i don't know but i think it's time to to say bye bye so go ahead marcella thank you 
Sí, lo que quería reforzar eh, en el concepto es que los agricultores eh, es bastante difícil que cambie porque son bastante conservadores y me parece que todo el accionar, digamos, por supuesto que sobre los agricultores también, pero trabajar mucho sobre los consumidores que realmente van a ser los que van a empezar a, a cambiar, eh, a elegir, digamos, qué alimentos consumir y a exigir qué alimentos consumir, y, y bueno, y por supuesto todo lo que tenga que ver con la educación, con la información, con el conocimiento y con la toma de conciencia en la calidad de alimentos que queremos como, como individuos. Eh, creo que, que todo el trabajo tiene que ver eh, eh, con eso, ¿no? y esta toma de conciencia que que la salud está en la comida, que la salud de la comida está en el suelo, que si el suelo es sano, digamos, vamos a tener salud, ¿no? Tomar esta conciencia desde la educación, en todos los niveles. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, this is work for us now. <laughs> Uh, Shiny, I will give you the floor for the, the final word and, and to say thank you and, and yes, thank you for, 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 this, for this webinar. Thank you. You are muted, Shiny, you are muted. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Hi, we have ran over the time, it's uh, 20 minutes past. We had budgeted for 15 minutes past, but this is way too long. So we are cutting down on a couple of things. I had hoped to ask at least one more question There was on funding and I don't, I, I don't think we should go into that, but we will uh, definitely get to all the questions and share the answers with all the participants. We would uh, write it up and share it as a document. And both ATP and SITS, I would really love to thank all our panelists and presenters and thank you for attending today. We have recorded the webinar and we'll send out a follow-up email in the next few days uh, with a link to the recording and uh, the answers to the questions. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Uh, good night, good morning, wherever you are. <laughs>